I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, we do have some new people, so um, I'm going to introduce Ava. And Ava is an acronym for the Abrams Engel Institute for the Visual Arts. And we are a visual arts center located on the campus of the University of Alabama at Birmingham. We present eight to 10 exhibitions a year, highlighting a mix of regionally, nationally, and internationally acclaimed artists focused almost exclusively on contemporary art. We serve a diverse audience of university faculty, staff, and students, artists, museum patrons, and donors, while simultaneously striving to keep our exhibitions directly relevant and engaging to our surrounding Birmingham communities. We help to represent the visual arts at UAB to local and regional institutions, but also the national and international art community. Since opening in 2014, Ava has been featured in the New York Times, the Huffington Post, The Nation, Raw Vision Magazine, PBS Canvas, among others. And we are proud that all of our exhibitions and related educational programming are free and open to the public. And since quarantine, Ava has been hosting a series of weekly live Zoom events featuring uh, discussions and interviews with artists, curators, galleries, collectors, and art educators from all over the country with guests from many corners of the globe. Tonight, I'm excited to introduce to you all um, Samuel Jablin and Nancy Little John. Sam was born in 1986, and he currently lives in uh, Brooklyn, New York. He is an artist and a poet who explores the discursivity and visuality of art and poetry, as well as the interconnection and possibilities of these two forms. He has been exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Queens Museum, MOCAD Detroit, Hauser & Wirth, Storefront for Art and Architecture, Freight and Volume, Mindy Solomon Gallery, and he has an upcoming solo exhibition at Nancy Little John Fine Art in Houston. Nancy Little John Fine Art gives the Houston arts community well-deserved recognition in the national and international art world bringing 30 years of experience as a patron, collector, art advisor, and gallerist, Nancy delivers an experience unlike anything you've seen. In 1998, she opened what has been presented as the most avant-garde gallery in Texas, by showcasing emerging talent through exhibitions, performances, and thoughtfully curated multidisciplinary events. Today, Nancy Little John Fine Art represents the very best nationally and internationally recognized, established, and emerging contemporary arts. I want to thank you both for being here tonight, and I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to y'all. Um, I'm also going to just remind everybody, if you have any questions, feel free to use the chat feature if um, something comes up while we're all talking, and then we'll open it up at the end for everybody. Hi, you guys. I'm Nancy Littlejohn. I'm here today from Houston, Texas, and we're going to have a little uh, chat with Sam Javelon. Is Sam here? Yeah, I'm here. Hey, Sam. <laughs> hey, how are you? I'm great. Nice to see your face, as always. Yeah, likewise. So, um, Sam, your work is an interesting study between visual art and the written word. So can you discuss your process with us a little bit and the idea of selecting the one word or short sentences that you paint? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, my work really starts off, like I started off as a poet. Um, I grew up my whole life, like my mom was a painter and I've spent like the majority of my life growing up in, in and outside of like galleries and studios. Um, so the two have always been like very like intermeshed for me. Um, but the process really starts for me of just, I'll spend a lot of time gathering texts, either like things I overhear or like little bits of poetry I write, or sometimes even if I read, um, and I'll kind of combine, compile like a list and then I'll sort of edit that down. And then as that edits down, I kind of decide what becomes a, like what becomes a painting in a sense. So each painting sort of gets like almost edited to a, fr to a single phrase or like a series of phrases. So Sam, there are a few questions that I'm going to ask you that are just 
the kinds of things that people want to know. And everybody is always curious about process, right? So in your process, what comes first, the words or the composition, color, size, or that sort of thing? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, my process is it's never like really so linear. Um, there's always like a bit of a back and forth. Um, I'll think a painting will be really working with like color it as a painting, and then I'll start adding text to it that might not work, and then I'll end up scraping the whole thing down and then repainting it and re-adding text, and it'll really like change and adapt, and it'll be kind of far off from where I originally planned it to be. Um, but there's always this like back and forth and like push and pull between like the text and the painting until they like really finally resolve. But it's, it's never like, I wouldn't say like one starts first. It's never like the painting is the first thing or the poem's the second thing. Like they kind of, um, evolve together. Do you feel there are similarities between the performative aspect of creating a visual work of art and poetry and spoken word? In the sense where they're both happening live. Like if you're reading, like if I'm doing a like performance, um, each performance is going to be kind of unique to it, to the circumstances, and the paintings kind of are. Even if I repeat a phrase, it's like they are very unique, like works of art. Um, but like my mind frame when I'm doing either is like so, like for like they're for, almost foreign to each other in my practice. So I kind of feel like the work is performative for the viewer, right? Because we were talking the other day about how you kind of start leaning your head sideways, trying to figure out what they say. And, and what, the way you arrange your compositions, you are forcing the viewer to have a slow read. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, they're both happening in a sense where it's like the painting kind of becomes the performance in a way. But it's like when I'm making it on my own, it's just for me. Um, but the work's... They really sort of inter, like intermesh. So it's like you're either like reading it or you're seeing it. And sometimes you like have to stop looking at the painting to read it. And sure. then you kind of miss the painting. So then you have to kind of just like back off and like just look at it. Um, and I, I like that ground. I like, like kind of play where you're playing with that ground. I love it. So how do you manage between the inherent chaotic nature of visual and written word and the structure demanded by these forms, like the rules associated with creating a poem or a painting? Um, so, I mean, like, this came up a lot when I was in graduate school. Um, a lot of people did not, a lot of my teachers and, like, other students at the time were always trying to push me to, like, remove language from the paintings and, like, really keep painting pure, in a sense, and really keep writing pure, in a sense. Um, and I just never really understood why. So I always kind of pushed against that with kind of like thinking of like, this is what I have to do and I'm just going to do what I have to do. Um, so I'll follow the rules of like making a painting, like the in forms in terms of like technique. So it's like, they're not going to fall apart. But besides that, like, even as I'm like writing it, like the, the text on a painting, like I'll move words around, I'll move letters around, or I'll drop a letter out of a word if I don't think it's working in the painting, or I'll just cross it out and scribble it out. So I kind of break a lot of those rules, like in terms of grammar. You're, you're a rule breaker. Some of your most recent works read chaos. Whatever happens, this is doomed. So do you think there's, or do you feel there's any negativity found in the media right now or the general state of the world that is affecting the work? I mean, for sure in certain instances, but I've always, like, my work I've always thought of as, like, I'm trying to make a painting that feels optimistically doomed. I so some of the phrase, yeah, so some of the phrases, like, become a series and I'll repeat them and, like, I'll just keep trying to make the painting a better version of it. And lately, I've been doing a lot of fucking chaos paintings. And for me, it's been a way to explore color and see if I can make a painting that's, like, it can say fuck, but it can be happy. Or it can say doomed, and it can feel uplifting. Um, and I actually don't see them as negative. Like, the fuck paintings move for me between, like, a sense of anger to a sense of a release. And I, I really think it, like, whatever the words say, the viewer ends up bringing a lot to them. Like, it depends how you read it. Nothing bad happens. Is this sarcastic or humorous? 
optimistic? I mean, for me, I've always thought that one, I mean, it's a lie. Like, bad things are happening all the time. Um, and I think this painting, is, it's sarcastic, it's humorous, it's optimistic. It's, it's like a painting that's kind of hoping for the best. So, um, 2019's Sun and the 2020 Untitled, which reads Love, read it as a couple of the more hopeful pieces of your work. Can you talk about the origins or trajectories of those two words, or the sun and the love pieces? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I started with the love paintings. Um, I really, they started off, I was in LA uh, just driving around with my friend Aaron Fowler, and we've been planning um, a two-person show together. And at the time, we decided on doing um, a fuck love show. So the love paintings really kind of came out of that conversation. And I wanted to see how the work held up against the fuck paintings. Um, and for the sun paintings, um, for me, they were just sort of like fun and like really lighthearted. And I was looking at just like how much color you could capture in a painting and like sort of make it like blast outwards. So you have a show coming up at the gallery. What are, what's the goal? What are you <laughs> looking at doing for the upcoming show? Um, I mean, since we, we started talking about the show like a year ago, and like since then, I mean, even over a year ago, and since then, like the world like changed, like completely changed. So I really kind of rethought the initial show we were talking about. And since then, I've really wanted to like capture a sense of what this time period is. So I want the body of work to kind of present um, sort of like a poem of this moment. So like, and I go, the title, uh, whatever happens, this is to me, like, I never really saw that as up, like, uh, as negative. I always thought of that as more of like coming to terms with something or like acceptance. Well, I think we're really going to be in for a treat this fall with your show, especially because you are such a wordsmith and poet. Um, I think that what you have to say will be important and significant. So your work is an interesting mix of just quick looks, few words, bold colors, and then kind of that prolonged gaze where you have the reverse mirror script. So how do you want the audience to engage or ideally view your work? I never see the works as really like a fast read. And um, they're essentially about paint and painting. And ideally, the viewer takes time to slow down and look at the work um, in the process, like, and like read the text. I make the text difficult to read, really, so people slow down and like really start looking at the, pa the actual painting and not just the phrase. But then there's always the phrase and there's always the text. But you have to like really spend a lot of time looking. So um, we've spoken a lot about the individual or individuality of the works. Can you talk about how they function together as a series? Yeah. Um, so the repetition of phrases is how I explore like form and color. So like if you see a bunch of chaos paintings or fuck paintings, it's really me figuring out the larger paintings in a sense. Um, and I'll really explore color. And as a body of work, I see them working as like a larger poem. So when I have an exhibition, I see the entire show working as one text. Right. And if like a work doesn't, like if a text doesn't work with the show, then I usually don't include it. Okay. So do certain words have an effect or inspire those of another? Like, do you try to put them in a certain sequence or do you just do one and then that's it? Um, they definitely inspire each other. Like one, I always think like the last painting I make leads to the next one. Um, so I'll like take cues from the paint, the last painting I make to sort of make the next body of work. Um, and it kind of, it's just, that's sort of how I work. Like whatever I most pre, like the most recent painting is like kind of the next ends up being like the next series or next body. I'm looking at what's on the screen and we're doomed. <laughs> and, and I'm going to turn it over to Tina because I know she has a few questions for you as well. Yes. Thank you. Um, so, Sam, your work follows in a long line of artists that incorporate texts. 
um, into their work. For example, um, Mark Flood and Mel Bachner, Barbara Kruger, Christopher Wool, and the list is long. Um, however, do you, in fact, feel more in tune maybe with the abstract expressionists? Since the application of paint, spontaneity, and bold use of color seems to be in line with that group. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, when I when I was just painting, the works were definitely more abstract in nature. Like there wasn't any text at the time, and my poetry practice was very much a poetry practice. Um, but I wouldn't say I feel more in tune with the abstract expressionists. I've definitely made like a lot of paintings that are like more gestural, but I've also made paintings that are more geometric, and I made monotone paintings. Um, but Joan Mitchell was like definitely one of my favorite painters, but I tend to jump around how I paint and, um, there are many different like ideas of, and concepts of abstraction in the work. And I've always used the text to sort of connect the, the different like bodies of work and to also like ground my practice. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So I know you talked about this a little bit, but I know that you use many of the same words such as chaos and fuck and over and over in, in your paintings. Are you looking to create the ultimate visual interpretation of a specific word or phrase? And when you feel like you've done that, will you ever abandon the word or phrase? So like with the repetition, I mean, I like, which is sort of a new thing for me is the repetition. Um, but I like all the ways sort of the meaning of a word can change based off how it's painted. Uh, and I've played with the ideas of doing a show of just one text, like so the whole show is just one phrase, but I haven't done that as of yet. And then the works on paper and the small paintings definitely have a lot more repetition because I'm seeing what will work larger. And they, I mean, they tend to be like a bit lighter and faster and more fun to make in reality. But I can do sort of like several in a day as opposed to maybe like five over six months. Like the bigger works just take me forever because of how they're painted and the layers that they need and the, like just the length of time it takes to dry between layers. Um, and then there's a ton of paintings where the text only appears once. Like a lot of them don't necessarily end up with more than one version. And like currently I'm interested in making sort of these anxiety based paintings. So there's been a lot of repetition of like chaos, fuck, don't panic, doomed, and whatever happened, this is. And so, as I'm guessing, that's what you've been working on in quarantine. So, can you talk about maybe how your work has changed or evolved during quarantine? Yeah, I mean, I've, I really went from like working like pretty much every day in my studio to working every day in like an apartment. Um, so the work's all the scale is all shifted, very small. From like the last painting I made in my studio before lockdown was for the show with Mark Flood, and that was. Um, that painting was like almost 10 by eight feet. And so I've gone to like 10 by 10 by eight inches. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I mean, I've really just used the time to like boil down um, my ideas of color and like form and how, how to really alter the color and play with the text and the colors of the paintings with the colors of the text and how it can change uh, just the overall feel of the, the phrase and the painting itself. That makes sense. Um, and can you talk a little bit more about how performance plays a role in your practice? Um, yeah, I mean, it really speaks to like my roots in poetry. Um, and it's always been like an outlet for me to collaborate with other artists on different projects. Uh, I don't do a lot of them just because of how demanding they are with just like organization and working with people and finding an outlet or a venue. But I mean, like the poet sculpture is a sculpture that I made that's it's actually activated by poets. And it's a it's about on its own and it stands about ten feet tall. Like this is we did it at the Queens Museum there. But so each poet will sort of break the sculpture apart, arrange it however they want, and then um, stand on it and perform their own work. Um, so that's one way of collaborating I've done. And then I did a project with and this is like um, a musician and a poet performing together on, on the sculpture. And then another project I did was for Storefront for Art and Architecture. And at one point they approached me to create a performance that would be poetry as architecture. And they asked me, um, they kind of just gave me free reign of like this green room they have. And it had like 
full tech setup, huge cameras, TV screen. It was like a little TV station. And so I had five poets kind of go out into the world and start writing poetry based off um, like billboards and signs and anything that was like wrapping a structure. So all the language had to come from a structure. And I had another poet just go out and like record Times Square for an hour. And then I had a video artist create uh, an hour looped video of just ads that were featuring New York City. So on the green screen, the ads were just looping and it was like a long hour long video. And then so the poets would be performing inside the video and inside the structures and then reading the poetry from advertisements. Um, and then the most recent one I did was for Nada. And they asked me to just like uh, do a reading of the poetry I was writing during quarantine. and. Um, I basically ended up writing a lot of poems about trash as I was just like walking around the city and like noticing how nothing was getting picked up and the city was just kind of empty. Do you want us to go ahead and play the the video from the Nada? Poem? Yeah, I think that's good. Perfect. Nothing is wrong. Love, due generosity. No one left out. We get sick together. Moments, looking out the window, sirens and silence, hunger, heat, nothing else matters, bittersweet, never ending, no regrets, garbage, piled on the street, lining the hallways, overflowing, piles, it hasn't been picked up, everything's under control, there's food for tomorrow. The sun. It's a pandemic. It's cloudy some days. Other days, the sun is out. Coffee. Coffee is the one thing that reminds me the day has changed. Humans. Numbers. Statistics. Tallies. Data. Percentages. Confident behind the mask. Sometimes, dead is better. Shit. It's cheaper to die. Who knows? Tomorrow. I wrote Comfort Can Fuck Itself on a painting. Blur. Days, nights, days, nights, days, nights, days, nights, days, nights, days, nights, days. Divided by meals. Divided by packages. Day to day. Night to night. Round and round. Transform. Filth. Salad container lids become pallets. Rice, beans, pasta, canned tomatoes, canned tuna, canned salmon, eat disasters. Trickster, dead ends without ends. Doomed, we are mostly dead things. Go with nothing. My tombstone, the best fucking trash. Bottomless glamour. That black void, that space where nothing and everything don't matter. Horrific freedom. Career suicide. Doomed one way or another. Trash. White trash, purple trash, green trash, blue trash, gold trash, black trash, red trash, yellow trash, pink trash, gray trash, orange trash, brown trash, bio trash. Disapproval. Just keep walking, walking, walking. One, the pleasure was mine, all mine, 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 mine. And so my last question for you, Sam, is... Do you want your viewer to interpret your words based on their personal experiences or are you ultimately steering them in a specific direction with your paintings? Um, I think it's important for like the viewer to kind of bring their own read to the work. I've definitely had people show me how they've seen a painting and it was so different than how I saw a painting that it kind of changed how I saw the painting going forward. Um, and I really liked that.
And like, I like how they can take on their own life in a way. Um, so Jason asked a question. He said, I'm curious if San, giving the vulgarity of certain words and phrases, has censored himself from creating certain works. Um, not as of yet, no. Have you ever been censored because of the words in your work? No, not yet. Um, not that I know of, at least. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with that, I'm happy to um, let anybody else jump in, ask a question, any kind of comments. You can unmute yourself, or you can send it in the chat. Sam, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, cool. So um, I've got a question. I saw that you did uh, an interview before... Um, he passed away, Vito Acconci, and you mentioned his name, um, uh, and you have mentioned his name before. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about your relationship with that artist, and was it a, was, were you influenced by him? Like, what, what, what's going on there? Um, I mean, so Vito was actually one of my mentors in grad school. Um, he's the reason I went to Brooklyn College, for instance. Basically, he agreed to work with me when I was looking at MFA programs. Um, but he was really, at the time, he was one of the only people I found who could move kind of seamlessly from writing and poetry into sculpture, video, architecture, kind of anything, but like yep. use poetry as a groundwork. Um, so when I was in grad school, I mean, we were really close. Um, and I mean, I, interv I did that interview with him for Bomb. Um, but he, th he passed away really shortly after I finished grad school. But yeah, he was definitely a huge early influence. Um, Sam, I have a question. Um, I'd just like to know if you, if you think maybe that your, how, how you think your work is maybe impacting how people access and just generally, um, think about poetry, I guess, um. I'm thinking specifically about how, like, most, I'd say a lot of books of poetry don't include images at all, and that um, is just a lot of the time how people are reading poetry. I mean, yeah, so, I mean, like, when I was really, like, I went, when I was in school for poetry, um, I would say my poetry was always, like, very visual. Like, if you looked at it on the page, it was, like, the words were all over the place, and, like, they were backwards, and they were forwards, and they were upside down. Um, it never really made it ton of sense to try to perform them mm -hmm. um so that's really why i moved them into like moved more into like the visual art world than staying in the poetry world um but i always found sort of like the poetry world the audience is sort of poets which is kind of amazing but it's also small um so after like i was in new york city and i went to i don't know like 10 or 15 poetry readings and i still go to a bunch but it's it's sort of the same audience a lot of the time um, and I, at the time I was really just looking to how you could expand it. And for me, it was like really like taking it into like the visual art opened up new doors, new worlds and like different access points. It was outside of like a poetry reading. I have a question. Go ahead. Hey, Sam. Hey, Sophia. Um, so I'm curious how the painting of words, I guess like do you paint with the same hand that you write with when you write words? Or like, how does that all work? Um, I mean, I use so many different things to paint with. So it's like, I'm like sometimes scraping things down with cardboard or scrape, like, it really depends on the painting. Primarily, um, like once I'm like actually putting in the letters, yeah, I use, this, I use my right hand. So it's the same hand, I guess. Okay. Sorry for the basic question. I just, I oh, just feel like I feel like writing is really different from painting, but for like me, so that's what my mind immediately goes to. It's like which hands you use and such. And I also think the computer has really affected a lot of people's like neural pathways with regards to writing versus you know writing on a computer versus writing in um, in physical form. Um, so um, yeah. I mean, I would say like when I find like when I clean up the letters, I, I definitely use my right hand. But like prior to that, I mean, I'm using like every, I'm using like both hands and like using like giant squeegees, whatever, like kind of whatever. Okay. But at the end, to like refine it for sure, I use my right hand. 
Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, of course. No, I've actually often wondered that myself if you use your dominant hand, especially because you um, have your letters backwards. And so I didn't know if maybe, not all the time, but I mean, in many of your paintings, you write backwards. So I've often wondered mm -hmm. if you use your dominant hand to do that or if you try to, you know, cause yourself a little bit of disconnectivity between your mind and your hand by using your non-dominant. So that's it. That is an interesting yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll definitely, I'll definitely use both, but primarily I use my dominant hand. Yeah. Where I'm just curious about the, like the use of backwards text a little bit. Can you talk a little bit more about where it came from that you wanted to do it? And is it in this like idea of abstraction and abstract painting, or is it really just to kind of suck your viewer in? Um, I mean, so I've always been pushing, like, just sort of, like, um, illegibility, mm -hmm. but, like, kind of keeping the work legible. Mm -hmm. um, and I used to do it with, like, I used to stick tons of mirrors and things into the t into the paintings, and, like, so they were, like, these little disco balls, and they were, like, almost impossible to read. Um, and I don't really remember when I started doing it backwards, but maybe, like, three or four years ago I did the first one. Mm -hmm. And it really just let people see the work as painting. And it really like kind of opened up a discussion more about painting than like the text right away. Mm -hmm. And then the text kind of came in and I that sort of led me to kind of keep pushing that direction. Yeah. And I was actually talking the other day with Scott about how I kind of look at your paintings almost in a, as abstract paintings and not text paintings um, mm -hmm. because of that illegibility within them. Um, the text is all, it's not that it's an, an, an afterthought, but it, it comes later. And for me at least. Um, so it's very interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, go ahead. I mean, that's more how I think of them. Like I don't necessarily like ever, I don't think I've ever called myself a text painter. Yeah. Um, uh, hi, uh, Sam, yeah. thank you for illuminating the work. Um, uh, just a couple of thoughts because, um, I think that the amplification of words like fuck uh, and doom and chaos, and even when they are projected on very large scale, um, they kind of take the awkwardness out of the room, at least in my mind, because they are so, um, you know, supposedly, you know, don't say them. And so seeing them so out there kind of makes you snicker. Um, so. Have you ever considered, Sam, um, using body parts like anus and words like that in the paintings? I know that sounds like I'm coming right out of kindergarten, but, it, you know, because they have that sort of absurdity to them, have you ever done anything like that? Um, I don't think I have. <laughs> <laughs> At least not yet. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's because we're in, you know, everybody keeps walking around, you know, pardon my French, everyone keeps saying, you can't make this shit up. I mean, I run into people that I don't know, and there's this great common denominator right now about how absurd everything is, how we're like talking to each other with face masks mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of walking around in a science fiction film. And, you know, so there's, it almost seems like anything is is up for grabs right now that that you know people are just sort of maybe worn down by the reality of our time so anything can sort of go when it comes to what people say so i don't know just a thought can y'all hear me we can hear yeah. you Tim. talking about the words several weeks ago we had Kay Rosen on our call and uh Kay is a uh, uh an artist who does lots of text and one of the things that she did was to play on the word and she says if you see Kay let me know <laughs> Got it? 
she's a, she's, a, she's a great artist. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was kind of funny the way the way she kept yeah. hammering that home. <laughs> She definitely does a lot of wordplay um, and uses letters in a very playful way. Well, um, if nobody else has any questions, we'll go ahead and end it for tonight. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us, but I especially want to thank Sam and Nancy Littlejohn for joining us yeah. tonight. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you.